Hey everyone, just so you know, this is part two of a three-part series on kelp worlds. If you're just tuning in, we encourage you to go listen to part one first. Everything will make a lot more sense that way. You are listening to season two of Future Ecologies. So, so the um, the the blue line is the the intertidal. So this is this is below or low tide. This is the beach. Okay, these are our ancestors. We come from the ocean, where we believe we're ocean people. So, the seafood and the fish and everything else are very. Um, much a part of our our food and so what's happening to the ocean is is critical for us and this of course is sea otter and in the old days the sea otters were um, harvested by the Ilana Auga or our hereditary chiefs and they were the people that were able to wear them, to use them as inside our homes, and to keep the cold out during the winter. It, it just tells who I am. Um, I'm the head woman. My, my brother next to me is our chief. And in the old days, the only people who would wear these things were people of high standing. With the coming of Europeans and the fur trade, it uh, blasted that part of our world apart. And so bringing these things back is a part of us revitalizing our world. So it's a really significant thing to see this headdress from this matriarch that has sea otter on it. it shows her standing and it shows the connection to the entire ecosystem and her people okay. so there's so much uh, symbology and protocol and law associated with that piece and it's amazing that you guys just got to record that and and see it and she'll wear it tomorrow at convocation Associate producer Simone Miller and I find ourselves in a room with two incredible women, transfixed by this beautiful ceremonial Haida headdress. It's a woven band with white and red and blue, topped with the softest fur I've ever touched, sea otter. I'm admittedly feeling a little nervous because we are about to have a very serious conversation. Um, we want the deep yeah. tones of our voice. Our voice is very my deep, deep tone. And beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does indeed sound very serious, Mendel. Uh, so who are these extraordinary women and how did you come to be sharing a room with them? Well, wow. <laughs> sharing this room with them. Yeah. A room makes it sound saucy. Um, while you were off in Santa Cruz catching up with Jim Estes and his career studying sea otters, I thought I'd look into what was happening with kelp here on the coast of British Columbia. And you can't research kelp in BC without quickly coming across Dr. Anne Solomon's work. My name is Anne Solomon. I'm an applied marine ecologist at Simon Fraser University and an associate professor there. And our other guest, who honored us by sharing her headdress. What part of me do I introduce? All of it. <clears throat> All of it. I'll be here till tomorrow. <laughs> That's true. There goes our hour. <laughs> yeah. uh, my name's Key Eljus. Uh, my English name is Barbara Wilson. And I am just graduating with my master's in education. Uh, I, I did my thesis on climate change and the impact that it's having on our world. Uh, at home, I'm, I'm a grandmother, I'm a mother, uh, I'm an elected representative of our village, 
to the Council of the Haida Nation. I sit as a chair for Indigenous Justice and in Residential Schools. I'm a matriarch um, for a clan, the Stawas Haida Gai, and we're the Eagle Clan from Kamshua on Haida Gwai. And I would like to congratulate Barbara on her convocation the day after we recorded this interview last fall. Congratulations. Okay, and uh, just for our non-Canadian listeners, what is Haida Gwai, Mendel? Haida Gwai is a large island archipelago off the coast of northern BC, just south of Alaska. Elder listeners might actually recognize it more as the Queen Charlotte Islands. They're the ancestral homeland of the Haida Nation and have been historically surrounded by hugely productive waters and kelp forests. Today, they're known around the world for the distinctive artwork and especially totem poles produced by Haida artists and carvers. I think that's all we need to say for now. Yeah, that's, en- that's enough for now. Okay, um, so you mentioned abalone at the end of the last episode, and, and I am so curious, what are we going to talk about with these delightful guests? Okay, so last episode, you took us on a grand tour through Jim Esty's career and the ecological insights we've been able to glean from that tough love triangle of sea otters, kelp forests, and urchins. We covered a lot of ground. We talked about keystone species, trophic cascades, hysteresis, some pretty heady stuff. For sure. Yeah, a lot of real ecology. But we didn't really talk about the role of human beings in the coastal ecosystem. We we had human beings detonating nuclear bombs underground and other human beings counting starfish and <laughs> hunting whales to near extinction and, uh, and human beings arguing over how to interpret data. Okay, granted, but those were almost all modern scientists or fisher people. I'm talking about day-to-day human relationships with kelp ecosystems, going back to time immemorial. But I don't fault you for neglecting this aspect of the story. You're far from alone. It seems so basic, and yet many, many scientists, applied scientists in my field, usually don't really think of of humans as part of the system, nor some of these key species interactions. And so we will go a long way if we just start by doing those few things. So today we're going to go a long way by doing just that, looking at kelp and shellfish ecosystems as if our lives depended on them. And in some very real ways, at least here on the coast, they very well just might. At least, that's how it's always been for the Haida and other coastal peoples. This episode, we're going to put aside those fancy ecological ideas and talk about what it's like to be in relation to otters, sea urchins, and kelp. And what happens when colonial governments upset a balance that's been maintained for thousands of years. This is part two of our three-part series on kelp worlds. I'm calling it Ocean People. Broadcasting from the unceded, shared, and asserted territories of the Penelicate, Huitzum, and other Halkomenum-speaking peoples, this is Future Ecologies, where your hosts, Adam Huggins and Mendel Skalski, explore the shape of our world through ecology, design, and sound. So we've been talking a lot about kelp from biological and ecological perspectives. So I couldn't help asking Anne, what does it feel like? to be in a kelp forest. Kelp forests are beautiful. They're like uh, liquid forests of the sea. And when you come up to them, depending on the ocean conditions, you can often see blades of golden kelp on the surface of the water. And if you're about to dive in them and explore them underwater, you usually have a couple of feelings associated with that beautiful view. A little bit of anxiety because you've got to gear up and usually the boat's jostling you around. You've got to find all your gear. And 
then you can relax again once you have all of your gear on and you go over the side of the boat, dive into the water and then all of a sudden you're surrounded by those beautiful blades of kelp and bubbles as you descend. And depending on what kind of kelp forest you're in, if you're in a bull kelp forest, you start gliding down along these beautiful stipes. These stipes are like golden ropes because at the top is the air bladder from which the fronds, the blades, the leaves of the kelp are at the top of the surface, right? So you're going down those long stipes down to the bottom. And if you're in a giant kelp forest and you see blades all the way down and it's, it's pretty different. And if it's a blue sky on a sunny day, you often see glimmering shafts of light going through the water and bouncing off the blades and it's gorgeous. And it doesn't stop there because as you get to the bottom, then you see all these understory kelps. And they're all different sizes and shapes and beautiful hues of golden browns and golden golds and they're just gorgeous and and I guess what also makes them so gorgeous is they're so fluid they're moving with the current and the swell and and uh, it is beautiful and then of course there's all the animals that live amongst this this beautiful liquid forest so with fish darting around or some moving quite slowly um, and usually at the bottom you tend to see this beautiful bright pink crustose coralline algae so it's a really beautiful contrast and on that coralline algae you often see lots of different animals so that's what i think of when i think of kelp from the surface of a boat and and below the water but there's one other place where you often see lots of kelp and like barb told you it's pictured on her headpiece there and that's in the inner tidal and what's beautiful about the inner tidal and all the kelps there is it's accessible to so many people that undersea world is really accessible to you know seals sea lions fish lots of beautiful invertebrates and a few people to get to scuba dive but the inner tidal is accessible to so many people and you can walk down to the seashore at low tide and see many of the things i've just described to you they're just flopped over instead of standing up and moving with the current that's an experience of kelp those of us who live on the coast are more familiar with basically washed up on the beach where it's easy to harvest and take home to eat <laughs> yeah you and barbara are on the same wavelength get it <laughs> wavelength kelp to me kelp is food and a very important food i've learned through my years of research that it provides um, extra enzymes to people who are ocean people and that extra enzymes allow us to extract vitamins and minerals from all the foods we eat as we are ocean people. So when we get herring spawn on kelp. Herring spawn on kelp? Yeah. It's considered a delicacy around the world, and it remains a highly valued traditional food to the Haida, who know it as Gao. The Haida and Coast Salish people in general are often spoken about as salmon peoples, but judging by the remains discovered in middens up and down the coast, herring peoples might be even more appropriate. This mighty little forage fish travels in these enormous schools, it's basically the basis of an entire oceanic food web here in the Northwest. Literally everything eats them. Salmon, whales, seals, sea lions, birds, and people. In the last few decades, most of the commercial herring fisheries have crashed here on the coast. But that's a story for another day. Suffice it to say that herring like to lay their row on kelps, and that the Haida have been harvesting and eating them together for thousands of years. But in recent times, an extractive commercial fishery for Gao has made even this mainstay of Salish cuisine much less common. It sounds delicious. It sure does. And the value of kelps as food is only one aspect of their importance to the Haida. It means that if, if we're rowing or if there's a big storm and there's lots of kelp around, there'll be a safe passage on the inside of the kelp. Um, and so it has a 
different relevance to ocean people than people who come to extract it for commercial value. Right. So it, it acts, kelp acts as a, a, a natural storm break. Exactly. I got the sense that these two could talk about kelp all day. So I wanted to make sure that I asked them about that kryptonite to the kelp forest, that bizarro world. What is an urchin baron actually like? Oh, picture this. A blanket of red on the seafloor where you have just high, high, high numbers of sea urchins, spiky red and purple and sometimes green um, invertebrates that have these long spines, some of them longer than others, and they're shoulder to shoulder. Um, And because these are some of the, our our rocky reefs most notorious grazers, there's very little kelp around. So imagine shoulder to shoulder, red spiky balls. Um, Underneath they have these these things called Aristotle's lanterns and they're, they're these mouth parts that can graze away at kelp and many, many other things. And underneath this blanket of mostly red, sometimes red and purple sea urchins, shoulder to shoulder, you tend to see that this bright pink crustose coralline algae. And so if there's any space in between the urchins or as their spines are hitting each other, you can see it through those spines. Imagine just an, a, a bottom carpet of pink. And often urchin barons they can be patchy, but around Haida Gwaii at least, they're vast. And so when you're diving and you look up, sometimes you just see, when the visibility is decent, um, red and pink that goes on for a long time. This is where we, as audio producers, are supposed to play the ominous music and tell you that urchin barons are bad and kelp forests are good. And here is how you can help the kelp Help me! Oh my god. <laughs> I'd been urging for a place to stick that pun in. No! <laughs> but as regular listeners to this program will find unsurprising, it just isn't quite that simple. For Barbara, urchins are also an important cultural food. For me, when I <clears throat> think of Gudengai, Gudengai is what we call the big red sea urchins. Um, I think of food because before they were commercialized and separated us from that, that was a very large part of our food. I can sense a pattern here. Totally. It's it's actually the gonads of the sea urchin that you eat. And this food is also a traditional Haida mainstay that's valued as a delicacy around the world. And with that, has come more commercial extraction. Right, so would it be fair to say that urchin barons are actually a boon for sea urchin harvesters? Well, not exactly. There are just so many urchins and not enough kelp. Kelp me! Oh, no. Because they're shoulder to shoulder and because there's not a lot of food around, if you crack them open, there's not a lot of food inside of them. They, the gonad is is really minimal. The, skinny. The skinny, this is right, exactly. Skinny and not worth it eating much because they didn't, there's not a lot of gonad in there. If you go up to the feed line in the shallow waters where it's wavy and there might be some kelps because the urchins, you know, they're affected by waves as well. And so they can't graze as efficiently and they get jostled around up in the shallows. And so kelp can grow up in the shallows. That's where you can get some urchins that have pretty decent gonad because there's food there. But in those urchin barrens, you know, they're high density of sea urchins, but they're like Barb said skinny little sea urchins, they're not filled with a lot of gonad. So, in urchin barrens, most of the urchins are too starved to be good to eat. It's only really near the shoreline where some kelps can survive due to wave action, that those large urchin persist. But often, commercial harvesters beat your average community member to that harvest, so sea urchin barrens are a pretty mixed bag. Oh, okay, so, uh, can I play the ominous music now? I guess. Just a little bit. Sea urchin barrens are a result of the extraction of the sea otters from our waters. Mm -hmm. And so what's happened is all those uh, sea urchins have been commercialized. And it means that 
more is taken from our waters without balance and so it's it's quite significant what's happening all around the world with the extraction okay so it's not the urchin barons per se but the attitude of extractivism whether it's uh, sea otters or, or urchins or or gao or even great whales that really disturbs both the ecological and, and social balance exactly and, and this is where Barbara's story and the scientific story we heard from Jim last episode, that's where they really line up. Too much extraction causing trophic cascades and having all of these unintended but predictable consequences for people and ecosystems. But now we're coming to the part where these two stories have historically diverged in a big way. So there's a really important species that lives off kelp that you neglected to mention last episode. Famously. Called abalone. Right. So uh, what is abalone? When I think of abalone, um, it's a beautiful marine snail. It's a what? (laughs) It's a marine snail. It's a gastropod. And it's got these really cool respiratory pores around the edge. And... They shoot sperm and egg out of those respiratory pores, which is pretty cool. Yeah. And when they are close enough, you can, and underwater, when you see the sperm and the egg in the water swishing around, right, that's where you, that's how they reproduce. They reproduce, like these broadcast spawners reproduce this way, and that it's pretty amazing to see. If you've never seen an abalone, then you've probably at least seen their iridescent shells, which are well known for their nacre, or the pearly inner layer of the shell. And like almost everything else that we've discussed around kelp forests, abalone are a delicacy that's prized in Haida culture and around the world. Abalone is, is another animal that grazes or is on the bottom of the ocean and, and uh, we use it for food again, or we used to. Um, it's amazing if you eat it right out of the water. I remember as a young girl, my father would take us out and we'd get abalone and you didn't dive for it. You just took what was along the shoreline at low tide. It was a way of conservation. And so now when, when um, people are diving, uh, even though they're protected, they're not. But they're very important. What, what does she mean by protected? Northern abalone, which is the species that occurs along the BC coast, is currently listed as endangered under the Species at Risk Act. And to tell the story of how it got that way, I'm going to bring one more person into the conversation. I'm Charles Menzies. I'm from the north coast of British Columbia, a member of Kakatla Nation. I'm a faculty member at University of British Columbia, and I spent most of my adult career either catching fish or, as I'd like to jokingly say, writing about fish. Uh, Charles is actually selling himself short here. He writes about shellfish, too. And specifically, abalone. Or, in Smilag, the Simshanic language spoken by the Kakatla, Bilha. Bilha. <laughs> Charles has lots to say about Bilha. Well, it's, a, it's tasty, <laughs> I have to say. It's one of the most delicious sea creatures one can consume. People sometimes think it's kind of tough and hard, and there's an element of that because you're eating the foot of an animal. And so that in terms of the way that it's like a snail with a single shell over its back, and there's this real strong kind of suction cup-like foot. And that's mostly what you, that, not mostly, that is what you eat. You peel it out of the shell, you scrape off the, the little bit of the viscera that's there, you clean it a little bit to get the black around the edges, and then you kind of, some people like to tenderize them, but you don't really have to. You just, you can slice them and fry them, steam them, uh, dry them. The older women, I've talked to some of the older matriarchs in the community, and they will talk about the old days, the old times of drying abalone, and where they'd first steam them in a pit at the beach, 
and then after they were steamed and cooked, they taken out and skewered on little cedar uh, stakes, and then hung in the in the in the smokehouse. And so you can almost imagine that you could you could kind of hear them clunking if you were banging them together. I mean, as a kid, my dad. I mean, I write about this in one of my papers. But as a as a kid, I remember we'd always get a feed of abalone. Would turn up somewhere, somehow. Either dad would bring it home from the boat, or somebody would drop it off. And I can remember him sitting there because, of course, he's the old style kind of guy. So he only cooked certain things. It was kind of like steaks, or he'd carve the turkey and prepare the turkey. So basically, as my mom did most of the cooking. But when abalone or fish like ulekan turned up. He did those. But I remember he'd stand there, of course he had a big production, he'd take these and he'd mal hit them with a mallet, he'd drop them in an egg wash, he'd put them in flour and he'd throw them in the pan. And you know, and they really kind of taste like, they do, literally do kind of melt away. Um, and I know my comparatives to tell you what it tastes like isn't necessarily going to help because I think it tastes like the, the lateral muscles in a sea cucumber. <laughs> so, you know, how is that going to help people understand? I actually have eaten the lateral muscles of a sea cucumber, so I think I get the idea. <laughs> I, I can only imagine because, dear listeners, we were unable to sample Bilha in preparation for this episode due to the fact that it's endangered and therefore illegal to harvest. Right. Uh, so how did that happen? Charles says that important cultural foods that weren't commercially viable to settlers tended to remain largely within Kakatla control, under the radar, so to speak. And up until the 1970s, settlers weren't that interested in bilha. In, in a weird way, there was no, no pressure on abalone stocks up until the 70s. And they were kind of sitting there... Um, people would harvest them. There's a recreational harvest. There was a kind of modest uh, commercial harvest. But then, in the 70s, there were major changes in the fishing industry. This was about the time that Jim was first heading up to the Aleutians, and when whaling was really picking up in the North Pacific. The Japanese fish market started to expand in a different way, and there's a lot of investment into Canada and other parts of the world, and abalone became a, uh, a species of interest. And uh, within about 15 years, abalone were destroyed as a commercial uh, fishery. And it's every single maneuver that was made to abalone in terms of uh, controlling and regulating them led to increased catches, <laughs> led to greater chasing them down and lower diminishing stocks. And by the time they get to the mid somewhere around the late 80s, they basically shut it all down and made it illegal for anybody to capture abalone. The Department of Fisheries and Oceans closed the abalone fishery in 1990, but they didn't just close the commercial fishery, they closed all fisheries. But as Barbara points out, it hasn't worked. Even though the law is supposed to protect it, uh, it's a commodity that's very precious and goes into the black market and people who are diving for other things um, are speculated to have access to those things at the same time. And on Haida Gwaii, because we have big islands and big water around us, it's hard to keep track of what's happening everywhere. Once the abalone stocks were depleted by extractive fisheries, it doesn't take a lot of illegal harvesting to keep them from recovering. At the same time, First Nations people like the Haida and the Kakatla, who highly prize abalone, are now criminalized if they attempt to harvest it, even though it wasn't their fault the stocks were depleted. A whole generation of young people, indigenous and non-indigenous like ourselves, has never tasted the signature food of the kelp forests. And for the elders who remember eating it, it's even harder. When our people get old and they're in their last days, that's usually one of the foods that they ask for. They would like to have abalone before they pass on, and so it's very emotional for us. And we talk about it all the time on how we'd like to be able to bring them what they want. And you can't easily because of the Canadian government, right? I know. Yeah. It's ridiculous. So that's one of the big problems, right? I mean, these kind of implications of these 
extractive events have ecological implications, they have social cultural implications, and they have emotional implications. I could tell, speaking with Barbara, just how devastating this loss is, on top of all the other challenges faced by her people under colonization. And colonial institutions have a nasty habit of adding insult to injury. In this case, while government biologists closed down the fishery in an arguably well-intentioned effort to prevent further declines, archaeologists and ecologists were arguing that, actually, Abalone was never an important food for coastal First Nations until very recently. Why, why would they argue that? I'll let Charles explain. The interesting thing is when First Nations communities then started saying in the middle of that, well, we have a traditional right to harvest abalone. You shouldn't inhibit our customary harvests. Uh, we agree that the abalone stock's been knocked down, but it's you guys and your dye fisheries and your targeted fisheries and your bad attitude about management that's caused a the problem. Then you started hearing things like, well, you never used to eat abalone. The implication being that if you can't prove that you ate abalone historically, why should you have any rights to it now? Now that we've, uh, f***ed up the fishery. And this introduces what I like to call the kelp forest parable. One of the things that's really big in the ecological world today in marine ecology is about biodiversity in the kelp forests. And the story is told sort of in this way. Wantonly destructive humans in the late 1700s and early 1800s, indigenous and non-indigenous cooperating together, decimated sea otters. Oh my God. Why do we care about sea otters? Besides the fact they're being exported to the Asian markets for great riches in the pelt, because sea otters are said to keep down the pernicious sea urchins, and as a kind of collateral damage, they push the abalone below the low mean tide mark where no human without adequate technology could ever encounter abalone. And then you have this massive diversity, and then after you extirpate the sea otters, the urchins start to roar back in, they mow down the kelp forest, you have a massive decline of biodiversity, you then see the abalone, the bia, start to kind of climb up the beach because there's no natural predator for them. And they get closer and closer, because my favorite line about these things is that people call, you know, the biologists call them cryptic crevice-dwelling critters. Uh, It's too many alliterations there. But of course, they they start to reveal themselves. And to carry this story along, some indigenous person is walking on the beach and sees this object and goes, oh, what is this? Let me look at it. And of course, reaches down, picks it off the beach and decides to taste it, says, I love it, and starts eating up abalone. Now, I'm being a bit tongue-in-cheek and facetious and a little bit nasty with the way I'm recounting this. But the point of the story is that, well, hey, look, guys, indigenous people might be, you might think they're ecologically sound, they're not, they destroyed the sea otter, and then as a a consequence of that, they derived an unmerited benefit of abalone turning up into their diet. And then over a hundred years or so, people have kind of got accustomed, they think they have always eaten abalone when we know they haven't, and any abalone they did have came from California with the Spanish fur traders, they'll point out. So what Charles is saying is that Jim Estes' foundational research on kelp forest ecology has been sort of weaponized to argue that before the sea otters were hunted to near extinction, they would have eaten all the abalone along with all the urchins, and that indigenous people would never have had access to abalone until recently as a result. Yes, except of course, as a result of trade. I think one thing that's important to acknowledge is the fact that our ancestors traveled up and down the coast and they traded for abalone. There's one species of abalone here in BC, but there are seven in California, and some, like the red, are quite large. The buttons that we use on our robes are made out of abalone shell. And so uh, in the old days, our ancestors traveled down, as far as we know right now, as far as California and maybe farther south and traded for the Golcha. The big ones are called Golcha. They're like this. Ours are are like this and are very thin and brittle. The big ones are, are very 
thick and they're they're easier to make things out of so you'll see it in jewelry or you'll see it in in um, sculptures and things like that these days and some of it comes from other places but our main source for the big ones was California. That sounds like a trade that way predates the Spanish fur traders, right? Definitely. Abalone had clearly been important here since before the sea otters were wiped out a couple of centuries back. But the main reason some archaeologists and historians would argue that coastal First Nations didn't eat abalone until recently is that they just hadn't found any in shell middens. So so you're saying that nowhere in any of the middens on the coast amongst all of those herring bones and oyster shells and salmon bones and what have you, all, all of that evidence for what people have eaten throughout time, nowhere have they found any abalone shells? Apparently not. But as a Kakatla person, Charles knew that archaeologists were wrong about the historical importance of abalone. And he also knew that northern abalone shells are actually quite fragile, which is why, as Barbara explained, California abalone were used for regalia. So Charles decided, what the heck? If the archaeologists couldn't find them, then he would. One of the things that kind of drove, drove my kind of curiosity was like, how come nobody's finding abalone? So I'd send these emails out to different famous archaeologists up in that, who do work in BC and Alaska and Washington State and ask them and they all assured me, no, there aren't any. It's one of these things I just assumed, of course it's there. So I, my first email went out and people said, no, no, that's, it was never done. So I said, okay, what do I need to look for? What am I thinking of uh, when I see this? What are people, are people seeing things that they're not recognizing because it doesn't meet the pre-existing criteria and then also where do you need to go what's the likely spot so obviously on the interior of the of the Kakatla territory you're not going to find abalone it's a different environment you need the kind of air highly aerated rocky shoreline with all kinds of crevices and things like that for these animals to survive so Charles took a team to an old village site at the south end of Banks Island on a hunch. And I actually remember the first time we came up though, because we were in the show, we do these auger tests, and we put the auger down. It's about a, um, a foot long device, it's about four inches across at the top, and it's just like a whole a fence post digger. And you screw it into the ground. 10 centimeters at a time and you pull these out. So I, I, we, we use a, actually a kind of a, a, a splicing fit little thing that kind of looks like a, a long narrow point in the front and a, and a curved piece of open cylinder. So you'd put, anyway, I don't know if this makes sense to people, but it's a kind of long po- pointy piece of metal with a nice ha- comfortable handle and you kind of poke it into the bucket of the auger to get the soil out. And I remember sitting there with people around, we were pointing this kind of first one out and we've gotten a couple and I got a Rubbermaid tote and I'm docking the soil and stuff out onto it and I said wow it's abalone it's just shiny you could see it shattering and shimmering everywhere and there was this kind of quiet pause as the archaeological grad students and the archaeological faculty colleagues who were with me just kind of quietly looked at it and kind of go hmm interesting hmm and then they said well because they didn't want to out and out tell me you're wrong That isn't abalone, but they also wanted me to not get too excited because I was wrong. That wasn't abalone because it didn't have any distinguishing characteristics. It just was smushed shell. So I'm looking at it and I know that's abalone. I said, there's no other way. And then there's all kinds of suggestions or provide insights. So I got a little bit kind of quiet myself and said, we'll just keep doing this. And, you know, and kind of the moment carried on. And then we heard this kind of yell from a distance, a kind of like... (laughs) Because my gra- one of my graduate students, and I'm going to name him. I mean, he was, wasn't my student, but Kenzie Jessam, great, great guy. Uh, he kind of crawled on the face of where the village hits the beach. There's always where, an erosion of, the, of, the, of the, the front of the village. This mat of growth, that web of organic materials like roots and stuff from a kind of mat and blanket, which as the shell underneath it kind of bleed, erodes out, it just wraps down like a cover. So you can kind of crawl under if you're brave enough. It's not necessarily the safest thing to do. Well, I thought maybe that something had collapsed on him, so we all go charging to hear the sound of this muffled yells. And t- no. He said, you got to come in and look. What he found was an abalone in the full shell, 
in the cliff face of this, the vil front of the village. It was undeniable. People couldn't say at that from that moment on there was no abalone. In fact, it was there. And so we went with that and said, okay, this is really kind of neat. And then we did the scientific stuff where you, you measure everything and you do everything that's proper and et cetera, et cetera, and, and you know, and take the samples. It's like a lot of things. You change your technique of measurement, you change your outcome. But you, if you don't have a reason to change your technique, you won't get any outcome. And the earlier generation of archaeologists in the 60s and 70s were all interested in big things. Big bones, big carvings, you know, spear points, harpoon points, all this kind of stuff. So they sieved their sites that they did with a half inch or a quarter inch maximum, but typically about a half inch. And then the, you get a kind of you expunge or use up all the public publishable data. And the next generation that came out in the 90s started thinking, maybe we should use a smaller sieve. What would happen if we go back? Because, you know, we've been realizing there's a lot of fish in these sites. Fish bones can be really small. So they start sieving down to an eighth of an inch. You know, and all of a sudden they find that instead of it being mostly salmon in these sites, it's, it's like a 30%, 40% herring bones. And so they change the technique and they get a different image of, of what's happening. And of course, that's all driven by this independent scientific model that's going forward. If they'd talked to people before, at least in these cases, because there's a human memory of these places, they would have said, yeah, you're going to find herring, and you're going to find salmon, and maybe there's other things that we don't remember, that you're going to find a lot of fish stuff. You need to look for it. And it's like, you know, sometimes we get, when we were doing the archaeology, people would often say, well, at colleagues, or when we publish stuff, is this indigenous archaeology? Is this archaeology with an indigenous direction? Is this, and I just said, well, I don't know, it's like a fishing trip. We're just going fishing, except we added a new thing. We're now taking soil samples. <laughs> what is it? I mean, I mean, why else would a person be there? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and say that I think Charles has his priorities straight. Agreed. So uh, we've put to rest this argument that abalone weren't an important part of the indigenous diet pre-colonization. Which really leaves the government with no excuse for closing the First Nations traditional fishery and criminalizing indigenous people who continue to engage in it, right? Yeah, not just criminalize, but aggressively police. It's a lot easier to camp out near the res and wait for someone to go picking abalone at low tide than it is to enforce the fishery closure on commercial dive vessels. Right, that makes sense. So, uh, I guess that brings us back to what Barbara was saying, that it's... It's ridiculous for the government to deny First Nations people access to an important traditional food that the government itself failed and continues to fail to protect from overexploitation where and when it really matters. Yeah, that's right. So a good solution would be to say, I don't know, have First Nations manage abalone in their own territory how they want to and focus conservation efforts on dive vessels and illegal poaching, right? Yeah, totally. But there is a complicating factor. There always is. <laughs> what is the complicating factor? Well, while it might not have been true that sea otters prevented indigenous people in the past from accessing abalone, it is a fact that when sea otters are present in an area, they can gobble up all of the big, accessible abalone near the shore. Oh. And remember those sea otters that were dropped off on the west coast of Vancouver Island in the late 1960s? during those atomic tests on Amchitka? I do. <laughs> well, the government of Canada didn't tell the indigenous people of the coast that they were going to reintroduce sea otters. They did not consult with the Nuchalnutl at all. They just brought them in and they dropped them off. And those transplanted sea otters took some time to get established. But once they did, they had no predators and nearly unlimited food. Their populations began to expand and eventually spread to the central coast of BC as well. And they ate lots of urchins and brought back more kelp. But they didn't just eat urchins. They ate abalone and they ate all sorts of other shellfish as well. About 1990, the first time I was out there, one of the old men rode me out into the middle of the bay one morning and he showed me the bottom of the bay and it was sandy and all you could see were big pox mm -hmm. everywhere where the sea otters had gone in and taken all the clams out of the um, sand 
and they talked to me about how their food was disappearing. Once sea otters get established, they can single-handedly clear whole areas of harvestable shellfish, those easy ones that you can get pretty casually. A couple decades later, Barbara and Anne decided to travel up to a village called Supiak in Alaska, where sea otters had become established decades earlier. They have had it in their waters for 60 years. When we went there, um, a group of us went there to, to visit with them and to see what they were being able to eat. It was quite um, sad because um, bedarkies, which are the little uh, Katy chitons, they're no bigger than my finger, was their delicacy. And a lot of their generations, probably three or four generations, had never seen other seafood because everything was cleaned up by, by the um, sea otters that are in their waters. And the only place they would find the bedarkies were in the crevices. Sea otters aren't like people in that they don't wipe whole populations out. There are always some shellfish hiding in the cracks. Abalone and urchins and other shellfish can survive happily in kelp forests with sea otters, but they're less abundant and more cryptic. Thus, they're really hard for people to harvest. Anything edible that's within reach of people, guaranteed the otters will get to first. And the beach that was at the head of the inlet, they told me that they used to clam dig there all the time and they, um, there were no clams there anymore. And so people were having to go, and, and these are people that don't have full-time employment, you know, and they can't, they can't gather food from the ocean like their ancestors did. They would have to take a boat and then drive for three hours mm -hmm. to go buy store-bought food, junk, junk because they couldn't afford anything else. You know, that is just despicable. You know, that, that, that a government would put people in that kind of situation and, and deprive them of absolutely everything. You know, it just makes me boil. That's really distressing, that on, on the one hand you have this widely known success story of sea otters returning from the brink and, and getting established again here, and then there's this ugly flip side that I, I think most people are probably not aware of. The other side of the story is, is the concern that happens when uh, sea otters come into an area and we have this, this balancing act of you know, how much is enough and how do we control them? With Sarah, the Species at Risk Act. We've talked about Sarah before on the show in our episode on Southern Mountain Caribou 2.1. It's Canada's endangered species legislation. And in the case of caribou, it's really failed for almost two decades to afford them the necessary protection. In the case of sea otters, at least at this point, it might be overly protective for areas with large populations. There's no ability to keep the balance. And if you think back about the different nations along the coast, and remember that we're ocean people, we lived from the ocean, about the ocean, on the ocean. And so our food sources come from the ocean, as well as we believe our ancestors came from the ocean. So when the sea otters were originally in our waters, there was a, a way of determining which areas you would allow the sea otters to be in and which areas would be saved for human food. So you had this active management regime that that was based on clan systems and 
believing that everything has a right to food. Okay, so you, you didn't just exclude them. You allowed them to, to live in other areas. I want to give you a really specific example that highlights what Barb's saying. Um, if you look at our Species at Risk Act and the policies associated with trying to, to do good, these are typically single species policies, right? So we're trying to manage for the conservation of abalone as an endangered species. And we were trying to manage for sea otters, uh, which were an endangered species. They were brought back and they have recovered quite well. So they've got downlisted to threatened status, downlisted again to a species of special concern where they are now. And yet here we are managing them with these singular policies and typically, you know, single studies of their species abundance and yet they interact, right? One is a predator of another, and guess what? Humans interact in that system too, and yet we tend to exclude humans from the picture and not even consider these very strong species interactions. So there is a lot that we can learn by thinking about some of the you know, hard-earned lessons that would have developed these, these deep time laws that is thinking about the entire system with humans as a central component to that system. Okay, so um, let me let me see if I can get this straight. Okay. It, in the present, it's illegal for coastal First Nations people or anyone uh, to harvest abalone. And it's also illegal to harvest sea otters in both cases for conservation reasons. <laughs> yeah. Because... Um, Basically, colonial practices allowed these species to be depleted. Yep. But somehow, before Europeans arrived on this coast, First Nations had laws and practices that allowed for sea otters and abalone and other shellfish to coexist in enough abundance to support wealthy, healthy societies. Yeah, you got it. If you look through deep time in archaeological faunal remains, middens, you know, the shell heaps that you can see um, what people ate in the past. You can see mussels that are, you know, three, four times the size as those that you would see in Cayucat now, where there is sea otter predation, suggesting that in deep time, just like Barb said, sea otters were kept out of some areas so that shellfish could thrive, so it could be eaten as food, right? And this whole idea of a spatial mosaic of uh, sea otter presence and absence, there's quite a lot of archaeological evidence for it. There is ethnographic stories. and oral stories about it. Um, and these are things that could be done again today. And it is a way, spatially, of getting the best of both worlds, of thinking about some of those key ecosystem interactions and the trophic cascade I described, but also the people, the people that... Um, are dependent on shellfish resources that have stored it in them in the past. So there's, I see this as an uh, optimistic way forward um, by learning from deep time, learning from these stories and trying to make things right again. The laws from different nations, the laws were set up so that we would be decent human beings, you know, it was about respect. It was about responsibility for everything. But it was also about sharing and looking after each other. And when you look at Canadian law, it's very adversarial. It's all about what you can't do. Whereas our laws were about how we, how we create resilience and live together and look after all things, not not just the human aspect of our world, but everything. I'm struck by this idea of a spatial mosaic of areas with and without otters, maintained by people with detailed ecological knowledge and rich protocols, it reminds me so much of our discussions about spatial mosaics and fire ecology and, and traditional management. The parallels are so striking and, and the consequences of ignoring that knowledge are really devastating. So um, where, do we, where do we go from here? It's often the end of episode question. <laughs> <laughs> We're not quite done. 
Anne and Barbara continue to do research together, and are part of a project called Coastal Voices. It's made up of hereditary chiefs, researchers, and indigenous people from up and down the coast. We're just the face. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> the beautiful faces. Yeah. <laughs> And you can go online to coastalvoices.net and watch the short film they produced and the interviews with the knowledge holders. It really shows you how much more there is to the story of otters and urchins and kelp. And abalone. <laughs> of course. Couldn't forget. In the next and last episode of our three-part series on kelp worlds, we're going to take you on a journey to Haida Gwaii where Barbara's ancestors have lived and eaten lots of seafood since time immemorial. Sea otters were hunted to extinction there, and it's one of the places on the BC coast where they haven't yet returned. We'll be headed to Guayhanes, or the Islands of Beauty, where researchers are looking for answers to these questions and digging into some mysteries that get at the very heart of what it means to be an ocean people. That's next time in part three of our series on Kelp Worlds. Thanks for listening. This episode of Future Ecologies was produced by myself, Adam Huggins. And me, Mendel Skolsky. In this episode, you heard K'il Juice, Barbara Wilson, Dr. Ann Solomon, and Dr. Charles Menzies. We'll be back next month on the second Wednesday. Please rate and review Future Ecologies wherever podcasts can be found. It really does help. And we love reading what you have to say. Special thanks to Simone Miller and Jim Estes. Music for this episode was produced by Lom Zoku, Sour Gout, The Western Family String Band, and Sunfish Moonlight. Also, we're super excited to announce that we've reached our first goal of 50 monthly supporters on Patreon. Which means that, in addition to stickers and patches and the exclusive monthly mini-episodes that patrons receive, Patrons will also now have access to special interview segments that we loved but just couldn't fit into our main episodes, and a new Discord server where patrons can chat with us and musicians from our show and even some of our interviewees. So, if you'd like to help us make the show, you can support us on Patreon. Your support and positive feedback is what keeps us going. So, thank you. And now we're going to have to come up with a new goal. What should it be? Drop us a line. You can get in touch with us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and iNaturalist. The handle is always Future Ecologies. You can find a full list of musical credits, show notes, and links on our website, futureecologies.net.